Hello and welcome to the News at 7 here on FECTV.com. I'm Noel Byrne and joining me this evening is Chris Bennett with all the latest on today's top news. Yes, uh, the murder investigation into the death of vet Car uh, Catherine Gowing has finally come to a head today. Clive Sharp, 46, from D-Side, has admitted her murder in court. Now, this was the story, if you'll remember, Ms Gowing, originally from County Offaly, worked as a vet in Wales. She went missing in October of last year. Um, the police then found her burnt-out car near a quarry and finally recovered uh, some of her remains, though not all of them, unfortunately, at the moment, around the River Dee. Uh, Judge in the case Justice Griffith Williams has said on record that he has only one sentence that he can possibly give here and that is life imprisonment. Now as I was saying earlier to you I was kind of surprised at the sentence in the sense that you know some might say it's not harsh enough uh, yeah. but maybe the justice system as it's set up there can't give a double life sentence I'm not sure the only reason I say that is because um, he first of all denied the charges at first mm -hmm. and you know it's took him this long to admit guilt and also he hasn't told where all of the remains are no um, I mean police believe that um, some of the remains were um, uh, sort of deposited or dumped into the River Dee itself which is obviously okay. making recovery of them I extremely difficult um, the judge himself has apologized to the family uh, in question over the delay now I believe it's it's delayed until February for when the sentencing will happen because what he wants to do is look again at the minimum sentence in okay. terms of how much he can serve now this he has gone record again by saying that there is no you know that there is actually a possibility that no parole will be given in this so that it will be a full type of life sentence um, I think you're right in, in what you said there though Noel that one of the bad parts I suppose about this is that we still have no motive that we still have no further information on why the crime was committed as such I suspect that this will come out in yeah. time um, but it's it's a sad day for the family when guilt has been admitted but no real interest or, I uh, suppose, evidence behind it has been Exactly. Has been Hopefully placed. there'll be a little bit of justice for them in, in the coming months Absolutely. as the case uh, goes on. Uh, well, moving on to our second story today, and that is of the Crow Park talks, which kicked off again today. For a whopping 30 minutes, Chris, 30 minutes. Uh, union chiefs and government reps met to discuss what is going to happen next, because the Crow Park deal is to come to an end in 2014. And I suppose the hope from the union's point of view is that there will be a Crow Park too, but the government need to make savings of 300 million this year and savings of 1 billion over the next three years. Now, it's thought that in terms of what's on the table at the moment, yep. the government want everything on the table, as do the Troika, who are kind of, you know, uh, the driving force yeah. uh, behind this. Um, so they're looking at, you know, cuts to allowances, more work for the same amount of pay, uh, a cutting of rates for certain, for certain things, as well as the uh, cutting of the incremental scale that a lot of people are on, yeah. as well as um, redundancies, compulsory redundancies. That's right. The, the Irish Independent actually ran uh, with a story today about compulsory redundancies. Um, there was a lot of talk of that it was going to be surplus jobs. I, I say surplus, you know, in a way. Yeah. Um, of posts that were no longer existent. Now, the Independent did sort of claim that potentially there could be 2,500 uh, redundancies in the public services sector and 1,500 in the HSE. Um, it's interesting, actually, I suppose, to talk about these compulsory redundancies because Kevin Callanan of Impact um, said at the core of the public service agreement is the guarantee that there wouldn't be compulsory redundancies. So this essentially goes back and saying, you know, the original Croke Park agreement, as is, suggests that these redundancies couldn't happen. Mm. But I suspect that the government may well still go ahead with them. But yeah, I think I think the union bosses really need to remember that this is you know this is the second version. It's not the same one. They kind of need no. a new one, and the unions are going to be extremely lucky if they're able to keep even half of what they have yeah, in, I mean, the, in the current iteration of it. Incredibly um, committed to this. Exactly. You know, if we, we can't beat around the bush here. It, something will happen, and it will go through. Something has to give, and. Uh, you know, if you're to look back at the last few years in terms of the austerity budgets that have been introduced here in Ireland, and a lot of people suffering as a result, I think to take the Department of Education, for example, 80% of that department's budget is restricted to pay and allowances, so it can't be touched under the Crow Park Agreement. So for the last number of years, um, we'll say Rory Quinn has been looking at 
how he can make cuts to his department without touching this massive white elephant in the room of the 80%. So every year they've been kind of chipping away at this 20% and now, you know... It's come to a head. I exactly. Suppose, really. So I think if they had been able to, you know, tackle 100% of the budget as opposed to 80%, the cuts, for example, in the Department of Education wouldn't have been as harsh. And I know it's, it's very similar in other departments. I think the Department of Health is between 70 and 80% as well in terms of pay. Yeah, you know, I mean, pay I suppose restricted. one thing we have to look at here really is the, the discussions that are going on, the, the talks, really, are they actually going to redress, um, I suppose, the balance between the private sector and the public sector? Because that's, that's what a lot of people are thinking about this. Now, obviously, the unions are going to try and you know, clamp down on that as much. But there are mandarins up there. There are people on increasingly large salaries, uh, incremental pay rates. You know, no matter how your performance is, your pay goes up by a certain mm, amount exactly. year on year on year. Those kind of things can't last much longer. They definitely can't. And apparently, uh, a statistic that's out there is that in comparison to the year 2000, we have actually 50,000 more uh, mm. people working in the public service. So you'd imagine as, um, we'll say, the money that can be pumped into the public service has started to decline, and we'll have to decline that, that 50,000 apparently surplus jobs of some sort um, will definitely be cut. Yeah, it's an it's a, it's a interesting thing, and I think we're going to see a lot more on it. Yeah, um, oh, definitely. <laughs> a lot, lot more. Probably for, for the next few weeks, months, years. Exactly. <laughs> Possibly. And, uh, I suppose to finish on a quote from him, Michael Noonan said, uh, he is, he's got confidence in Brendan Howland and his negotiators because they are quite skillful. Quite skillful? Quite skillful. Not like 100% skillful. Just, just, just quite, quite skillful. skillful. Excellent. Uh, to move on to other news, uh, still here in Ireland, and we're going to look at it in a bit more detail as well, is the spate of serious crimes taking place on the streets around Ireland, specifically violent ones. Um, I suppose today we had the news of an uh, 18-year-old that was shot in the head yesterday evening, and it emerged today that a 19-year-old has been arrested um, following on from the incident. Now, I don't know how, but the 18-year-old was actually able to make a phone call to the uh, ambulance and indeed the Gardaí as well, and he was able to actually identify um, the person assailant. who tried to murder him. Sounds like a, a very lucky individual there. Exactly. Um, we also actually had today uh, Craig O'Halloran, uh, a 19-year-old, has actually been formally charged with the murder of Kevin Kenny in Dublin 2011. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, Kenny was an electrician who was stabbed outside of a pub uh, and died shortly afterwards in hospital. Now, it has taken a while, but it does seem um, that the Garde have, have sort of got their, got their man this time, hopefully, for the, for the family and friends out there. And elsewhere today as well, a trial kicked off at the Central Kim Criminal Court over the murdering of David Byrne in 2011, March 19th. Uh, he was left apparently with nowhere to go um, as he tried to escape from his killers. Um, he was chased into a car park and was kind of put into a corner where there was a seven foot wall, so there was no way for him to escape. And 19 year old Marcus Kerwin, he's been charged with the killing of uh, Mr. Byrne, and he's of course pleading not guilty. I mean, there are, there are two things, I suppose, Noel, that, that really sort of strike me about this. Um, one is the, the sort of the, the rise in instances of these type of violent crimes, and obviously the severity of them. But another instance that sort of hits me here is the, the age of the people who are actually committing them. They're, they're young, young men, um, basically, you know, 18 years, 19 years, that type of thing, who are committing these crimes. Do we think, really, that, that Ireland is seeing a rise in this, um, and, you know, for whatever reasons? I think that there is definitely a rise, and I think a lot of it can be, you know, linked back to gang violence on some levels, and the fact that gangs are able to get their hands on guns of all sorts, that the Gardaí can't use any type of gun then at all. And I think there'd be a certain fear for the Gardaí in terms of tackling these issues as well, because, you know, they're putting their life at risk, and it's a lot to ask of any guard. I'm not saying Gardaí aren't good at their job, they're all brilliant, but I, when confronted with gangs um, who can be a lot more violent, um, I think it's, it's a tough one for them to tackle. It is a tough one. I think, obviously, you know, looking at, I suppose, the, you know, the budget, I suppose, going back to that, in terms of socioeconomic uh, factors here, that a lot of this violence does tend to come out of the, the lower strands if, of the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, and obviously, the, the sort of heaping on of even more pressure in the economy is, is not going to help that. Um, certainly back in the UK, a lot of these, this gang violence is, is quite prevalent. 
Um, and a lot of the work tends to start with community-based projects to, to sort of get that, get the people out of the okay. gangs before they go into them. Whether that's something that Ireland needs more of is, is potentially a, a way forward. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see, I suppose, if that's one avenue maybe the government kind of take in terms of you know, tackling this issue head on because something definitely needs to be done. And just going back, I suppose, to the gang aspect and in relation to the 18-year-old that was shot, um, it, it emerged today that the 18-year-old himself comes from a family of gang members and is in a gang. And apparently within the last week or so, he was involved in an incident with an older rival um, criminal who, as the incident unfolded, the older criminal left with less credibility because the 18-year-old kind of took him on head on and kind of, we'll say, came out the victor in it. So this may have been the result of, you know, his... It goes back to the respect thing. So exactly, yeah. I mean, your man, I suppose the respect wasn't shown and he knocked him down a peg or two. Mm. Um, so this could very well have it's been a, the it's result. It's a startling thing, really, to think that Ireland is now getting this sort of, uh, so his blood feud, this blood vendetta type of exactly. thing that's coming in. Um, we're going to move on to something that's a little bit perhaps more light-hearted <laughs> now. Um, back to our old favourite Silvio Berlusconi, who is back in the news. Now, Karima El Marug, uh, aka Ruby the Heart Stealer, one of my favourite names, will testify uh, at ex the ex-Prime Minister's trial uh, over charges of sex with a minor, a charge which could carry a 15-year prison sentence if he is convicted. Now, Mr Berlusconi, who is 76, I, I might point out, uh, is accused of paying for sex with Ms Marug when she was under 18, a charge that actually both of them deny, which is the interesting part there. Now, a court in Italy has denied Mr Berlusconi's request to halt the trial, uh, which has obviously gone on to expose details of his various bunga bunga parties and, and all sorts of things like that. Now, it, it's a fantastically interesting thing for those of us who aren't Italian. Yes, he's had a brilliantly entertaining um, personal life that's emerged, you know, considering he was such a big political leader. Yeah. Um, but I Slightly suppose. Slightly farcical. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I suppose from what I'm wondering is who put this in motion in terms of if both of them are denying it who exactly is to blame well, for getting this out there i suspect if you if you go if you go with mr berlusconi it's the feminists and the communists and the legal system in italy who have ah, yes. basically got a vendetta against him and it's not the feminists out. it's the bloody communists it's, <laughs> it's one or the other but no i mean that's that tends to be who he blames for this now obviously mr berlusconi is potentially going for re-election again um, or at least his, his party is. Yeah. Um, whether or not this will hurt him more, I doubt it. I don't think the man can be hurt anymore by scandals. I, yeah, without a doubt, I'd say we're definitely going to keep an eye on this one and see how uh, his life unfolds, because it's definitely an he entertaining is, one to keep an eye on. He is the keeps on giving. But to stay in Europe, uh, this time to France, and it has emerged that most mass protests took place over the weekend on the streets of Paris, with around half a million people coming out against the possibility of the introduction of gay marriage across the board being legalised. And uh, I was actually quite surprised that it's such a strong number came yeah, out I'm, in I'm, force. I'm shocked. For, for a country like France, which is so sort of vehemently secular um, in its position, it's, it's interesting that they came out in such great numbers for something which is essentially, I suppose, a religious issue. Yeah, I mean, Francois Holland, his government are trying to introduce uh, this bill at some point this year to kind of reform the whole area and I think one of the things that m might have people riled up is the fact that it will also allow full gay adoption rights. Yeah, which is obviously a horrible thing to oh, allow Oh it's for. a crazy idea, I mean how could they introduce such a thing? Um, so I think this may have angered, I imagine anyway, this has probably angered them more based so on what you're saying. Sort of, I suppose the Christian right. Yeah, essentially. Exactly. Um, but still, half a million people to, to throng the streets of Paris. I mean, they're calling it the largest protest in decades. It's a large, large number. Um, something that we'll have to keep an eye on, but I do believe that the government are still going to push ahead. Yeah, they're hoping to have the bill kind of, we'll say, down by the end of this month and then to have it fully um, introduced by June. I so suppose for once I can, you know, it pains me to say so, but I can go around and say, actually, well done, France, for, well for done. pushing something like this through. Yeah. Um, our, our final final story of the evening um, involves a, 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 a sort of a, an annual uh, event which happened yesterday uh, on the subways around the world. 
This was the annual No Pants Subway Ride Day, which sounds slightly like a Japanese computer game. Um, it was set up by the comedy group Improv Everywhere as a prank 12 years ago, but now it's become an international hit uh, with people on subways and undergrounds across the world taking part. It's got some very simple rules, Noel. Um, Do you tell. I will. <laughs> you, you turn up. Um, you ride the subway or the underground um, from various stops. You don't talk to anyone else who is involved in the, in the movement, the moment. Um, you wear suitable clothing, so obviously for this time of year, woolly hats, scarves, gloves, that kind of thing. Okay. But no pants, and that's trousers for anyone in the sensible world out there. Uh, I think it's a brilliant idea, and I, I, I'm glad you know that it's kind of taken off as much as it has. Um, it hasn't taken off in Ireland just yet. I don't imagine people hopping on the Lewis. Um, you know, in, no. in their boxers. Although I'm sure there's been many a night where someone has stepped on the loose and seen, you know, the results of the night yeah, before. Yeah, I mean, ho hopefully we'll see a few more uh, banana hammocks and, and that kind of thing on the, on the Irish uh, it, train system. You know, it could, it could result in a lot more um, dates, you know, people getting together, because, I mean, for the ladies, from their point of view, I suppose, they'll be able to tell pretty quickly if the guy is interested in them or not. Absolutely. You'll, uh, you'll certainly, you'll see where you stand. Exactly. <laughs> to put one. it one way. <laughs> to, put it, to put it bluntly. Um, that was the news. Yes, indeed. Once Don't again, forget, um, tonight at 10 o'clock here on FECTV.com, we're going to be discussing the future of Irish politics. Is it in safe hands? You'll have to tune in at 10 to find out. Thank you very much.